into two. Now this is the account of how Marduk Supreme Being himself declared and built Babili, and how Inanna, warrior kings commanding, made blood flow and allowed sacrileges. Aha, so see, now we're getting into how Inanna, through her greed, started bringing about uh, the origins of blood sacrifice. Again, yet another thing that was introduced to us by these so-called extraterrestrial gods. After kingship to Urim and from Unaki was transferred, Nanar and Ningal smiled on the people. As his rank of 30 befitting as the god of the moon, Nanar was worshipped. As the count of the moon in the months of the year, 12 festivals each year he decreed. To each of the 12 great Anunnaki, a month and its festival were dedicated. Throughout the first region to the Anunnaki gods, great and lesser ones. Shrines and sanctuaries were built. The people could directly pray to their gods. Now, they're, now see, that's, that's where we start to see this, this changing around. Because even, even the Anunnaki themselves refer to the creator of all things, and they talk about how sometimes some of the things that, that happened to them could only have happened if they were decreed by the creator of all. So what we see here is not only that they are admitting that there is a uh, creator in, in, of, of all things, but they're also admitting that they themselves are portraying themselves to the humans as being gods as well. So right there, that's a very, very uh, important admission. Shrines and sanctuaries being built all over the world so that people could directly pray for their gods. Now, now to me, this coinciding with the first occurrence of Inanna bringing blood sacrifice to humans is a very, very interesting thing. That's where, where we see direct evidence that blood worship, blood sacrifice, things like what the Mayans did and other, other groups and other tribes, and, and what we even see in warfare today, like we talked about last night with John D. and the Macrobes, we start to see that uh, these two things go hand in hand. The setting up of, a, of religion, the deifying of the Anunnaki, of these extraterrestrials as gods themselves, while at the same time also bringing about blood sacrifice. And this goes a long way towards, towards trying to find out and really understanding where the origins of the elite, and the New World Order, and the Illuminati really come from. And, you know, the blood and the, you know, think about Catholicism. You take in the blood of Christ, the body of Christ. That's blood ritual. That's the taking into the body. So where do you think that came from? That came from these people. In the first region, civilization from Ki Engi spread to other neighboring lands. In the cities of Man, local rulers were designated as righteous shepherds. Artisans and farmers Shepherds and weavers exchanged their products far and wide. Laws of justice were decreed. Contracts of trade and espousal and divorce were honored. In schools, the young ones studied. Scribes and hymns and wisdom, they recorded. Abundance and happiness were in the lands, but quarrels and encroachments were also there. All the while, Inanna and her skyship roamed from land to land near the upper sea with the Utu she frolicked. To the domain of her uncle Ishkur she went, Dudu, beloved, she called him. To the people who in the upper plain of the two rivers dwelt, Inanna took a liking. The sound of their tongue she found pleasant, and she learned to speak their language. By the name of the planet Lamu, which we know is Mars, in their tongue, they called her Ishtar. And there again, another thing that, that uh, some people have problems wrapping their mind around. Inanna, Ishtar, Columbia, Queen Samiramis, it's all the same thing. That's why Enki and, and Ia 
and Zeus and uh, Quetzalcoatl. All these things are just different names for the same thing. Iruk, her city, Unaki, they called. Dudu as Adad in their language they pronounced, Adad. Sin, Lord of Oracles, her father they named. Urim, city was by them was called Ur. That's where the ziggurat at Ur was built. So this is, you know, this is right there. This is definitely, as we know, the upper plain where the two, twi two rivers dwelt. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, between the, 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 the land between two rivers, the city between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's where Inanna took to liking. And uh, that's why we see, like, like Zohar sent us from Pakistan, those pictures. Um, and Inanna, in, uh, that's what those, that fucking alien pincher crab people thing coming out of that rock represents. And uh, here, here it is. I mean, setting up that, that's so interesting to me that, uh, you know, the deification of gods and <coughs> blood sacrifice all just happened to happen there in the, that area of the Middle East that is so famed in biblical lore. Shamash, bright sun in their tongue, they called Utu, and him too they worshiped. Enlil, by them, Father Elil, he was called, Father Elil. Nippur, by them, was Nibiru Ki. Ki in Gi, land of the lofty watchers, Shumir, in their language, was named. Sumir, Shumir, Shumer, Sumeria. In Shumir, the first region, kingship between the cities was rotated. In the second region, Egypt, Diversity was not permitted by Ra. He wished to reign alone in the region. The eldest of heaven, firstborn who was on earth, thus by the priest to be known, he wanted. So there is um, uh, Marduk, who has now become Ra. And where do you think Ra came from? Amen Ra. That's Ra's full name, Amen Ra. When you say Amen, where do you think the origins of that it was? When you say every time you say Amen, you are giving thanks to Ra or Marduk, the Anunnaki god. And what 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 coincidentally enough did Amen Ra also bring in? Anybody? Monotheism. The basis of Judaism. The basis of Christianity, the basis of Islam, and boy, it just happened to be in that area in the Middle East. God, that's just a coincidence. Amun Ra was was the founder of monotheism, the idea of one God and to worship one God alone. Oh, I mean, that is the proof. Only someone who wanted to be a God would do that, because you notice that. In the Bible, it's, you know, it's always talking about plurals. Man was made in their image. Well, whose image? That's plural. So he wanted to make sure that the priests who would take over power after, I guess, I guess after these, there were no more of these Anunnaki's left, but the priest, he wanted to make sure the priest knew that he was the firstborn um, and is the eldest person that is left that came from heaven. And what they refer to as heaven is their planet, Nibiru. Isn't that something? All these years, all these Christians, oh, I hope when I die, I go to heaven. I hope when I die, I go to that alien planet. Your grandmama's not around with us anymore, son. She went to Nibiru. Yeah, it's going to be a long flight, but she's going to be all right, baby. She's not in pain anymore. <laughs> Grandma went to Nibiru, baby. It's all right. Jesus. The foremost from the earliest times, so he decreed in the hymns to be called. Lord of eternity, he who everlastingness has made, 
presiding over all gods. Again, this is Marduk, Amun-Ra, declaring this. The one who is without equal, the great, solitary, and soul one, the soul one, meaning I'm the only one, I'm it, don't worship anything but me, I'm the one God, you don't need anything else, I represent the other God because I am the son of God. Well, well, the real God couldn't be here. His holy majesty, the big kahuna. So he sent me, and I'm his son, and uh, I'm here to tell you all what you're going to have to do down here and how things are going to be. And if you don't follow that, you're going to go to hell and burn, boy. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Doesn't sound anything like Jesus, does it? Nah. Doesn't sound anything like any of the rest of these Messiah figures that have appeared all around the world in different names and different shapes. But that's it right there. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm the middleman. Yeah, I'm God's middleman. You can go through me and find eternal peace, but you can't, sure as fuck can't get it on your own. That's for damn sure. Don't think that, no. So Mardot, as Ra, did place himself above all other gods. Their powers and attributes to himself he assigned. So he started, this, this motherfucker, Big Nuts uh, Marduk over here, starts going around, he's so arrogant, he's going around telling people, well, yeah, there are other gods, and yeah, there is a god of gods and a creator of all things, but he gets his power, he gets his shit from me, son. You know, who do you think God's dope dealer is? Me, I sell him that coke. That's what he's saying, no. Well, yeah. There are other gods, but they get their power from me. That, that's, that's real nice. As in Lil, I am for lordship and decrees as Ninurta for the hoe and combat. As a dad for lightning and thunder, as Nanar for illuminating the light. As Utu, I am Shamash, as Nurgle over the lower world, I reign. So he's basically saying he's taking on the jobs of all these other uh, Anunnaki gods. As Gibble, the golden depths I know, whence copper and silver come, I have found. As Ningazita numbers in their count, I command the heavens my glory bespeak. By these proclamations, the Anunnaki leaders were greatly alarmed. To their father Enki, the brothers of Marduk spoke. Nurgle to Ninurta conveyed their concerns. What have you overpowered? What has overpowered you, Enki said to his son Marduk. Unheard of are your pretensions. The heavens, the heavens my supremacy bespeak, Marduk answered his father Enki. The bull of heaven, in Lil's constellation sign, by his own offspring, was slain. In the heavens, the age of the ram, my age is coming. Unmistakable, the omens are. In his abode, in Eridu, the circle of the twelve constellations, Enki examined. On the first day of the spring, the beginning of a year, sunrise was carefully observed. In the constellation stars of the bull, was the sun that day rising. In Nibiru Ki and Urim Enlil and Nanar made the observations. In the lower world where the instrument station had been, Ninurgal attested to the results. Still remote was the time of the ram, the age of the bull of Enlil it still was. Now that's interesting. Because that's, that's exactly the, the, the similar time period we're in now. And every time there is, there is one of those ages on Earth where you're coming out of an old age and you're moving in closer to, because it happens over the course of, you know, a very long time period to so move through these ages. But as you're moving out of one and closer, it's getting closer and closer to a new age coming in, there starts to be conflicts all over the planet and all over society in all, you know, from the top to the bottom where the, the feelings and the ideas and the uh, ways of the old age are at conflict of the new age that is coming in. And so during that period that can last for hundreds of years that we've, we're in now and will continue to be in, I think, for the next five or six hundred years, um, you're, you're going to see great strife and cataclysm. That's exactly what's going on here. Because even though they were technically still in the age of the ram, 
the energy of the age of the bull was coming in. So Amon Ra is, you know, his bull nuts are fucking about to drop. He's walking around. <laughs> raging like a bull, right? And uh, he's the energy is overtaking him. He's ready, you know, he's ready to rule. He's ready to rule over the domain. Because, um, But that energy that's taken over him is at odds with the fact that the energy of Enlil and the age of the of the ram is still very much there and still very much will be for a period of time. So, um, but that's interesting. So, is 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 that an explanation to maybe you and me? Is that what's going on now? Is the age of the last the last Anunnaki god and the next Anunnaki god, which may be in Enki coming into the age of Enki, as Zohar sent the email to us that we read last night? Could that be why all this stuff is happening? Very well could be. In his domains, Marduk did not relent in his assertions. By Nabu, he was assisted. To domains, he sent not his emissaries, but to the people that his time has come to announce. To Ningazita, the Anunnaki leaders appealed. How to the people to observe the skies to teach. In his wisdom, stone structures Ningazita devised. Ninurta and Ishkar helped to erect them. In the settled lands near and far, the people saw and were taught in the skies that the sun in the constellation of the bull was still rising, they showed to the people. With sorrow did Enki watch these ongoings, how fate had twisted the rightful order he pondered. Now, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? How fate had twisted the rightful order. And, it's, it, and that just goes to show that like, that's where, well, that's a source of our misery. Because we make this, well, what we deem to be order and law and order, we make these laws, we make these things, but when fate and destiny and that thing overpowers those laws, we don't know how to handle that. And that's exactly what seems to be going on here. After the Anunnaki declared themselves as gods, they became dependent upon mankind's support. In the first region, the Anunnaki decided to unify the lands under one leader. They desired a warrior king. To Inanna, the adversary of Marduk, the task of the right man to find, they entrusted. A strong man whom on her journey she had met and loved, Inanna indicated to Enlil. Arbakad, of four garrisons, the commander, was his father. A high priestess, his mother was. Scepter and crown Enlil gave him. There you go. Except there's your other proof. There's the there there there's we we see the scepter and crown coming down from royalty that the Queen of England and all royalty has to this day the scepter and crown that is the that right there is is the initiation of making someone who was an offspring of the gods uh, in, in a position of royalty and power. That's why we have secession of, of royalty and hereditary dictatorships all over the planet today. Everyone that we still have that's still intact to this day goes back to that. To that very moment when the offspring of the Anunnaki were put into positions of kingship and power based on their DNA and their bloodline. This is where the establishment of the bloodlines that are in, are, are in place today by the elite who stay in power because of this bloodline, that this is it. Sharukin, righteous regent, Enlil appointed him. As on Nibiru, as was once done on Nibiru, a new crown city to unify the lands was established. Agade, the unified city, they named it. Not far from Kishi, it was located. By Enlil and Shurukin empowered, Anana accompanied his warriors with her weapons of brilliance. 
all the lands from the lower sea to the upper sea gave obedience to his throne. At the borders of the fourth region, to protect it, his troops were stationed. With a cautious eye on Inanna, Ra and Shuriken constantly gazed. Then, as a falcon on his prey, he pounced. From the place where Marduk reach, was reaching the Tower of Heaven, had attempted to build the, the, the Tower reaching Heaven, Shuriken moved sacred soil from there to a gate to therein implant the heavenly bright object. Now, this is interesting. Now, I think now this, now as we talked about the other night, I think this heavenly bright object, it may be the Ark of the Covenant. Because he talked about moving it, or, or at first planting it in the ground, and the, the location that they described was in Africa. And that's where many people to this day believe it still is, even though it's been proven that it's not. But here it's been moved, it's being moved to somewhere else. And each time, these, these Anunnaki are moving it around, and they're moving it to a different land and burying it under the ground. Enraged, Marnock rushed to the first region. With Naboo and followers to the tower's place, they came. Of the sacred soil, I alone am the possessor. By me, the gateway of the gods shall be established. Bow, chicky, bow, bow, baby. You hear that? Oh, snap. That's, that is a hell of a fucking admission right there, folks. You know what that means, right? Oh, yeah. That means that if that is true, what they've described here is, is this, this heavenly bright object is, in fact, the Ark of the Covenant, which many people have described as a power source. That means that by this description, wherever this Ark of the Covenant is located, in that spot, you, will, you can build wherever you have it. Once you build it underground, you can build a, gate, a gateway of the gods. And we know that a gateway of the gods, as their earlier descriptions entailed, is a stargate. This confirms what I've thought about for years and heard about for years through, through tidbits and pieces. But that's indeed what they were looking for in Iraq during the invasion in 2003, because apparently Saddam Hussein, I mean, all the places we're talking about here, Ur and, 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 and Babylon, all this stuff, I mean, that's the heart of Iraq, y'all. I mean, that, the, the Saddam Hussein was, was digging up all this stuff. He got wind of all this information. He was put in as a puppet by us. But he started researching the history. He started finding out about this stuff that was there. And, uh, dude, he was in power. But that's a hell of an admission right there. I mean, I, I've never really put that together. And I haven't heard, I don't, I sure as fuck hadn't heard them talk about that on Agent Aliens, have y'all? They probably will now. Supocalypse will probably get up there and go, I was the first to talk about the Ark of the Covenant being a power source for the Ark of the Covenant. And I fell asleep in the tanning bed again. God damn it. <laughs> but seriously, that's exactly what that's saying there. So if it's true that the Ark of the Covenant now is in Yemen, and according to Gary Vay and other people who have gone, there's a lot of, in my opinion, that's where it's at. And as soon as I started to find out about it, I told you that'll be where, that'll be the next, that'll be the next threat. That'll be where they'll tell us Al-Qaeda is next. That was in uh, the fall of 2009, back when I was still in Oracle. When we, those shows were up, you can listen to those. When we did a whole show on that, and all our listeners started going out and trying to find different information on the Ark of the Covenant in uh, in Yemen. And lo and behold, uh, just about three months later, we had the alleged underwear bomber, the crotch bomber that was allegedly was going to blow up the plane with a crotch bomb that wouldn't have worked anyway. But what the matter is, they told us he came from Yemen. And we started to see Obama uh, bomb attacks and rocket attacks not uh, too long after that. And the people of, of Yemen have been trained genera generationally for thousands of years. Going back to the brick and stone and, you know, uh, spear days, they have been trained generationally there to protect uh, Sheba's palace where the Ark of the Covenant is. And it says that the Ark of the Covenant can only be uh, brought out when a friendly nation is overhead. As if th this thing knows. 
So that's why they're over there. And they're, you know, they're sending back all these stories. Oh, Yemen's terrible. They're Al Qaeda stronghold, and their children, eight year olds, have AK forty sevens over there with Smurf stickers on them. The eight year olds have AKs, and yeah, the eight year olds have AKs because they have been trained generationally for thousands of years to protect what is there. Not to go out and kill white people because they hate them for our freedoms. They hate us for our freedoms. They're big about catters. I hate them all. I want to nuke them. Turn them into a glass parking lot right now. I hate them. No, man. They're protecting something that is there, and these motherfuckers know full well what's there. If there's nothing to it, how come there's been a military naval blockade? Fact. All off, the, all off the coast of Yemen since 2009. Just sitting there, parked. We've got cruisers, battleships, a whole fleet of naval ships parked off the coast of Yemen since 2009. This is a huge revelation for me. The idea that whatever this is buried in the ground, this is what they, the heavenly bright object, power source, allows them to open up this gateway of the gods where instead of having to wait or, or take a ship or anything else, Anunnaki can come through the gate and then go back through it. Of the sacred soil, I alone am the, in the, am the possessor. By me shall a gateway of the gods be established. So Mardok, Ra, did vehemently announce. Uh, did you guys ever see Stargate, the first movie? Stargate, they ripped that. They ripped that whole goddamn movie straight out of this. Straight out of this. If you've never seen the first Stargate movie, not the TV show and all that crap, but the first, uh, you know, the one with Kurt Russell. If you haven't seen that movie, go back and watch it because, dude, that is what that movie is about. That's what it is. And Raw is like this. They, they, if you watch, he's like an, he's, he's, he's undoubtedly an alien. He has the metal suit that comes out on the outside of him that makes him look like, you know, an animal, like what is depicted in the, in the Egyptian drawings. But then when he wants to come out, he comes out and his eyes glow. Yeah. And he's on like a ship. And on the ship, they've got a, uh, uh, exactly the technology that they described last night that we talked about. The, the technology that the Anunnaki did not give to humans for regeneration. That it was a, you know, it was an immortality machine. If somebody's dead, it'll bring them back. That's in the movie. I mean, I knew when I, when I, the times when I saw that movie that they were riffing on, um, you know, real stuff. But my God, the connection between Raw, that's who the, the, the main guy is in that movie that's doing all this stuff Raw, and he's in a, 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 parallel, a parallel world. And they figure out how to jump to this parallel world using this ancient Stargate that was, that was uh, dug out through an archaeological discovery. Man, they took that shit straight out of the Sumerian text, man. I watched that movie about, I don't know, seven or eight months ago, but I want to watch it again now. That's, that's unbelievable. I mean, we've seen examples, you know, there's always, they always fictionalize the truth, so the truth seems like fiction. That's what science fiction is there to do, the sole intent and purpose of it. But, I mean, now I'm thinking about it. My God, they took that entire movie straight out of these Siberian texts. That is mind-blowing. So Marduk did vehemently announce he was the only one to set up the Stargate. He gave instructions to divert his followers to the river. They raised dikes and walls in the place of the tower, the Asagel, the house of the utmost god for Marduk, they built. Babili, the gateway of the gods, Nabu, in his father's honor, named it Babylon. The gateway of the gods. In the heart of the Eden, in the midst of the first region, Marduk established himself. Inanna's fury knew no bounds. With her weapons, she inflicted death on Marduk's followers. The blood of people as never before on earth flowed like rivers. To his brother Marduk, Nurgle came to Babili. For the sake of the people of Babili to leave, he tried to persuade them. Let us peaceably wait for the true signs of heaven. Nurgle said to his brother. Marduk agreed to depart, and from land to land he watched the skies as he traveled. Amun, 
the unseen one in the second region was was henceforth called Ra. <coughs> okay. So that's when we start to see Amun Ra come in. So Amun, the unseen one in the second region, was Ra henceforth. So he became Amun. That's interesting. He was Ra first. He then he went to another land and watched over that land from the skies. And as he went to the second region, the first region being the Eden, uh, he went to the second region, which we know was still Egypt, went back there and watched from the skies. So that's interesting. So essentially what these guys did, oh, that's, that's choice. That's choice. They, they faked their own deaths. They told their followers after they set up their societies that they had died and gone on to the afterlife, but they didn't die and go on to the afterlife. They went to another region and went up in their ships and watched over their, their uh, area from the sky. Ah, that's genius. That's genius. For a while, Inanna was appeased. Two sons of Shurukin were his peaceful successors. Then on the throne of Agade Shurikin's grandson ascended, Naram Sin, by Sin Loved, he was called. Sin Loved was this guy named. This guy was named Sin Loved. <laughs> in the first region, Ninurta and Enlil were absent. They had went to the lands beyond the oceans. In the second region, Ra was away. He traveled to other lands as Marduk. So this guy's going around. Yeah, what a pimp. He's going to these other lands. Hello, I am Marduk. I have returned. Worship me. Here I am. Okay, Marduk is off to die again. Maybe he will return one day. Until, until I return, though, worship me. Worship me, because I'm going to return one day. And all of you unbelievers who didn't believe I was coming back, hellfire and brimstone for you bitches. All right, peace. I'm out. Then he flies over to some other region. Hello, I am Ra. I have died, I've returned. Yes, I am your great God, Ra, the one true God. I've returned. You thought it was dead, but I have returned. Guess what? Any of you bitches that didn't believe in me, didn't believe I was coming back, guess what you're going to get? Yep. Hellfire and brimstone, motherfucker. That's ridiculous. This is your religion, ladies and gentlemen. This is your religion right here. He's just fucking rolling all the time. Yeah, yeah, I'm raw. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Oh, you don't believe in me? Sucks into the cock. Her chance was in her hands to seize all power. Inanna envisioned to seize all lands of Naram Sin, the lands that she commanded. To march against Megan and Malua, Marduk domains, she instructed the Naram Sin. The sacrilege of an earthling's army through the fourth region passing Naram Sin was committed. He invaded Megan, the sealed Ikur house, which like a mountain is, and attempted to enter. By the sacrilegious transgressions, Enlil was infuriated. Upon Naram Sin and Agade, he put a curse. By a bite of a scorpion, Naram Sin did die. By the command of Enlil, was a gate wiped out. At the count of a thousand and five hundred years on earth, this did happen. Now, this is the account of the prophecy by Galzu and, and to Enlil to envision. So, um, that leaves us at the top of page 30, or actually towards the bottom. Uh, right in the middle, rather. <laughs> we'll get it right eventually. Uh, 301, page 301. And uh, we're going to leave it right there tonight. Man, interesting stuff here. All this all this stuff we've been reading. Uh, the connection of the Ark of the Covenant and uh, the Stargate thing. That's huge. That's huge. Um, you didn't. You, you certainly didn't hear that on H&A Lens, I don't think. Good stuff there. Now this is the account of the prophecy by Galzu given to Enlil in a vision about Marduk's supremacy and how man chose to survive a calamity. After Marduk, after Marduk became Amun, as in Amun-Ra, 
Amen Ra, the monotheistic sun god of Egypt, who brought about the one god system that all religions are based on to this day. Kingship in the major religions. Kingship in the, in the second region disintegrated. Disorder and confusion reigned. After Agade was wiped out in the first region, there was disorder. Confusion reigned. In the first region, kingship was in disarray. From cities of gods to cities of man, it moved about. Unag Ki, Lagash, Urim, and Kish, Isin, and to faraway places, kingship was shifting. Then Enlil consulted with Anu and deposited the kingship in the hands of Nanar to Urim, in whose soil the divine heavenly bright object remained implanted, kingship was granted for the third time. In Urim, a righteous shepherd of men, Nanar as king was appointed. Ur-Namu was his name. Like, like Ur, the name of the, the area, Ur. Equity in the lands Ur-Namu established. He made an end to violence and strife in all lands. Prosperity was abundant. It was at that time, in the nighttime, that Enlil had a dream vision. The image of a man appeared to him, bright and shining like the heavens he was. As he approached and stood by Enlil's bed, Enlil recognized the white-haired Galzu. In his left hand, a tablet of lapis lazuli he was holding. The starry heavens were designed on it. By the twelve constellation signs, the heavens were divided. To them with his left hand, Galzu pointed. From the bull to the ram, Galzu shifted his pointing finger. Three times the pointing he repeated. Then in the dream vision, Galzu spoke up to Enlil and said, the righteous time of benevolence and peace by evil doing and bloodshed will be followed. In three celestial portions, the ram of Marduk, the bull of Enlil, will replace. One who himself has declared as a supreme god will seize supremacy on earth. A calamity that has never before occurred by fate decreed will happen. As at the time of the deluge, a righteous and worthy man must be chosen. By him, his seed will preserve civilized mankind as by the creator of all intended to be preserved. So did Galzu, the divine emissary, say to Enlil in the dream vision. When Enlil from the nighttime awakened from the dream vision, there was no tablet beside his bed. Was it an oracle of heaven, or did it all in my heart? Did I in all in my heart imagine it? And Lil wondered to himself. To none of his sons, then are among them, did in Lil tell of the dream vision he had had. Among the priests in the Nibiru Key Temple of celestial of savants, in Lil inquired. Tirhu, an oracle priest, indicated him to the high priest. Of Ibru, of Abarkad, the grandson, he was descended. Sixth generation of Nibiru key priests he was. With the royal daughters of Urims, they were intermarried as with intermarried with the kings. Get yourself to Nanar's temple in Urim and observe the time the heavens for the celestial time. Seventy-two earth years is the count of a celestial portion. The passage of three thereof record carefully. So did Enlil say to Tahiru, the priest, he made him count the prophesied time. While Enlil pondered the portents of the dream vision, Marduk went from land to land. Yeah, he's going around setting himself up a shop, setting himself up as a god everywhere. Amun-Ra over here, Quetzalcoatl over here, he's going around setting up shop everywhere. Of his supremacy, he was telling the people to gain followers was his purpose. 
in the lands of the upper sea, in the lands of the key and Gi border. Nabu, Marduk's son, was inciting the people. To seize the fourth region was his plan. Between the dwellers of the west and the dwellers of the east, clashes were occurring. Kings of hosts of warriors formed. Canvas ceased going, and the walls of cities were raised. What Galzu had foretold indeed is happening, Enlil said to himself. Upon Tiru and his sons descended a worthy of a worldly lineage, Enlil said his gauge, his gaze, rather. This is the man to choose, by Galzu indicated, Enlil said to himself. To Nanar, without revealing the dream vision, Enlil thus said to his son, In the land between the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, ancient Mesopotamia, Arbakad had come, establish a city like Urim, a home abode away from Urim, let it be for you and Ningo. In its midst, establish a temple shrine. And appoint the priest Prince Tiru to be in charge thereof. By his father's words abiding, Nanar in the land of Arbakad, the city of Haran, established. To be high priest in its temple shrine, Tiru he sent. His family he sent with him. When two celestial portions out of the prophesied three were completed, Tiru went to Haran. At that time, Ur-Namu, the joy of Urim in the, western land, in the western lands, fell from his chariot and died. On the throne of Urim was his son Shug, uh, Shulgi, who succeeded him, full of bile and eager for battles Shugli, uh, Shulgi was. In Nibiru-Ki, he anointed himself high priest. In an unig key, he sought the joys of Anana's vulva. Straight up with it right there. Yeah. So this, this is Mr. Big Nuts, what we ought to call him. Uh, Shulgi. S-H-U-L-G-I Shulgi. Shulgi comes in and is like, all right, let's fuck some shit up. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I want to fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you. I want to fight. I want to fight. I want to fight. Fuck you, fuck you. I'm going to get me some in Vanana's vulva. He sought the joys of Vanana's vulva. That's going to be my new pickup line. Excuse me, miss. Hi, how you doing? Um, I, uh, I am, uh, I'm, I'm seeking the, the joys of your vulva. I want to go back to my place. You might actually get some with that one. A, a chick would probably be so thrown off. I'd like to. I'm interested in uh, in, in the joys of your vulva. Yeah, you, you you think you might be interested in, in that? <laughs> Warriors from the mountain lands, not beholden to Nanar, in his army he enlisted. With their help, he overran the western lands, and he ignored the sanctity of the mission control center. In the sacred fourth region, he set his foot. He declared himself king of the four regions. About the defilements, Enlil was angered. He spoke to Enki about the invadings. The rulers of your region have exceeded all bounds, Enki said bitterly to Enlil. Of all the troubles, Marduk is the fountainhead, Enlil retorted to Enki. Still, the dream vision, keeping to himself, Enlil turned his attention to Nirhu. Upon Ibiru, um, the eldest son of Tirhu, Enlil ca cast the choosing gaze. A princely offspring, valiant and with priestly secrets, acquainted Ibiram was. Ibram, I'm sorry, Ibram was. This is where I think Abraham came from. Ibram. So he was a priest that was familiar with priestly secrets that came from the Anunnaki. Funny how it's always the, those types that set up religions, isn't it? I'm not totally convinced. You talked about Mormonism. I'm not totally convinced that uh, 
Well, I mean, it's that's that that is what 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 Joseph Smith claimed. He had a, what what would you would call a spiritual, like an extraterrestrial experience. Yeah, and he was chosen as the one to bring those out because of his bloodline, because he was of that bloodline that came from the Anunnaki. That's why he was chosen to bring it out. All religions are like this, folks. All the all religions of the world come from these people to protect the sacred places. Enable the chariots' ascents in in descents. Enlil commanded uh, commanded Ibram to go. No sooner did Ibram from Haran depart than in that city Marduk arrived. The defilements he too had observed, as birth pangs of a new order he deemed them. From Haran, on the threshold of Shumir, his final thrust he planned. From Haran, at the edge of Ishkir's domain situated, he directed the raising of armies. When twenty and four earth years of his sojourn had passed in Haran, Marduk made a tearful appeal to the other gods or whomever else had descended, confessing his transgressions but insisting on his lordship. He said to them thus, O gods of Haran, O great gods who judge, learn my secrets. As I girdle my belt, my memories I remember. I am the divine Marduk, a great god. In my domains, I am known as Ra. For my sins to exile, I went. To the mountains I have gone, in many lands I have wandered. From where the sun rises to where the sun sets, I went. To the land of Ishkur, I came. Twenty-four years in the midst of Haran, I nested. An omen in its temple I sought. Until when, about my lordship, an omen in the temple I asked. Your days of exile are completed, to me the oracle in the temple said. O great gods who determine the fates, let me set my course to my city. My temple, Esagil, has an everlasting abode to establish. A king in Babili, in Babili, a stall, install to my temple house. Let all the Anunnaki gods assemble and accept my covenant. So did Marduk, confessing and appealing, announce to the other gods his coming. By his appeal for their submission, the Anunnaki gods were disturbed and alarmed. To a great assembly, take counsel, and Lil summoned them all. All the Anunnaki leaders in the in the Nibiru key gathered. Enki and Marnok's brothers also came. They were all agitated about the happenings and opposed to Marduk and Nabu, they all were. In the council of the great gods, accusations were rampant. Recriminations filled the chamber. What is coming? No one can prevent. Let us accept Marduk's supremacy, Inki alone counsel. If the time of the ram is coming, let us deprive Marduk of the bond of heaven and earth. Enlil proposed in anger. So they're saying he's got the bond of heaven and earth. He's got control of the Stargate. So they're saying, let's take that away from him. To obliterate the place of the celestial chariots, all except Enki agree. To use, therefore, the weapons of terror that Nurgle suggested, only Enki was opposed. Of the decision, Earth to Anu pronounced the words. Anu to Earth repeated the words. What was destined to be by your decision to undo will fail, so did Enki say as he departed. The evil thing to carry out Ninurta and Nurgle were selected. So that's that's the area uh, where they're talking about using this weapon of terror, a nuclear weapon. That's they're talking about using that in the area where Ra was was empowered, and that was the area of Egypt. Uh, and it's interesting that, that out there in the in the desert we have all this yellow glass that that the Egyptians later used to carve out scarabs and things out of, uh, it does indicate there was some sort of high-energy intense blast in that area. 
307, page 307. Now, this is the account of how fate did lead to destiny. 307. So that's where we're going to be uh, picking up at next time on the broadcast. I want to thank everybody for being with us here tonight for the show. My website is theglobalreality.com. It's www.theglobalreality.com. Again, there is the, uh, we, we have the, the donate button there that you can use for any amount, up to $10,000 a day. I think it is. You can use it up there. But we, uh, we need some support right now in a big way, folks. We need support to buy new gear. I, I got to have support just to live and survive. And it's just been nil and slim over the past couple of weeks. Uh, so, I mean, this is, we're in need of help. Please help us out if you can. TheGlobalReality.com, chip and banner, donate button, and uh, P.O. Box if you can't use PayPal. My name's Josh Reeves. I love you all. Take care. to destiny and how step by step some and long forgotten times taken made the great calamity happen now let it for all time be recorded and remembered well, this sounds like this is going to be important stuff here when the decision to use the weapons of terror was made Enlil kept two secrets to himself to no one before the terrible decision was taken, did Enlil reveal the secret of Galzu's dream vision. To no one until the fateful decision was made, did Enlil disclose the hiding place, uh, disclose his knowledge of the terror's uh, hiding place. When despite all protestations, the council permitted to use the weapons of terror. When Enki, angry and distraught, left the council chamber, in his heart, Enki was smiling. Only he knew where the weapons were hidden. So Enki thought. For it was he, before Enlil had come to earth, who with Abigail, Abgal in the palace, in the place unknown, 
he did hide the weapons. That Abgal uh, was exiled by Enlil to a place uh, to a place disclosed was unknown to Enki. When Enki heard this secret secret in his heart, he harbored a wishful thought. That for such a long sojourn, the weapons of terror would have evaporated. Little did Inky expect the long, the long sojourn would cause a calamity as never before known on earth. Thus it was that without Inky needing, Enlil disclosed the hiding place to the two heroes. Those seven weapons of terror in a mountain they abide to them, Enlil said. In a cavity inside the earth they dwell, with the terror to clad them is required. Then the secret of how the weapons awaken from their deep sleep, Enlil did reveal to them. So these weapons, these seven weapons, are buried in a mountain somewhere deep inside of the earth, and they're referring to them as being, as being asleep. And they have to be woken up. So what are they referring to here? Could it be that they're referring to almost as, as what we refer to as a computer in sleep mode? You know, it looks like it's off. I mean, it's on, basic functionality, but it's there. But you had to pull it out of sleep mode for it to work. You could be what they're talking about here. Before the two sons, one of Enlil, one of Enki, they departed to the hiding place. Enlil said words of forewarning to them. When the weapons are used, the place of the chariots must be vacated by the Anunnaki. The cities must be spared. The people must not perish. In his sky ship, ship Nurgle soared to the hiding place. Ninurta was delayed by his father. A word to his son alone, Enlil wished to say. A secret to him alone to reveal. About the prophecy of Galzu and the choosing of Ibram to Ninurta, he told. Hot-headed is Nurgle. Make sure that the cities are spared, that Ibram is forewarned, to Ninurta, Enlil said. When Ninurta arrived at the place of the weapons, Nurgle had already brought the weapons from out of the cavity. As their emmies from the long slumber he awakened, to each one of the seven, Nurgle gave a taskman, a task name. <coughs> the one without rival, the first weapon he called, the blazing flame he named it, the second. The one who with terror crumbles, he called the third. Mountain Melter, he called the fourth. Mountain Melter, wow. You know, one weapon that just melts mountains, so well, that's good quality. Wind that the rim of the world seeks, he named the fifth. And the one who above and below no one spares was the sixth. The seventh was filled with monstrous venom, and it was called the vaporizer of living things. These are seven different weapons, all that have a different ability. With Anu's blessing, the seven were given to Ninurta and Nurgle, with their, their with to wreak destruction. When Ninurta arrived at the place of the weapons of terror, Nurgle was ready to destroy and annihilate. I shall kill the son, and I will annihilate the father. Nurgle was shouting with vengeance. The lands they covet will vanish. The sinning cities I will upheaval. So did Nurgle, enraged, announce. Valiant Nurgle, will you, the righteous with the unrighteous, destroy? So did Ninurta, his comrade, ask. The instructions of Enlil are clear. To the selected targets, the way I will lead. Behind me, you will follow. The decision of the Anunnaki is known to me, Nurgle said to Ninurta. For seven days and seven nights, the signal from Enlil, the two awaited. As was his intention, 
When his waiting was complete, Marduk returned to Babili. In the presence of his followers, with weapons armed, he declared his supremacy. 1,736 was the count of earth years then. On that day, on that faithful day, Enlil sent the signal to Ninurta. To Mount Mashu, Ninurta departed. Behind him, Nurgle followed. The mount and the plain in the heart of the fourth region, Ninurta surveyed from the skies. With a squeezing in his heart, uh, he gave a signal and a sign to Ninurta. Keep off to him, he signaled. Then the first terror weapon from the skies, Ninurta let loose. The top of Mount Mashu, with a flash, it sliced off. The mountain's innards in an instant melted. Above the place of the celestial chariots, the second weapon he unleashed. With a brilliance of seven suns, the plain's rocks were made into a gushing wound, which just liquefied them. The earth shook and crumbled, and the heavens after the brilliance were darkened. With burnt and crushed stones, the chariot, the plain of the chariots was covered. Of all the forests that had surrounded the plain, only tree stems were left standing. It is done. Ninurta from his skyship, his black divine bird, he shouted. The control that Marduk and Nabu so coveted, forever of it they will be deprived. Then to emulate Ninurta, Nurgle desired to be Era the Annihilator, his heart urged him. Following the king's highway to the Verdant Valley of the Five Cities, he flew. In the Verdant Valley, where Nabu, the people, was converting, Nurgle planned to squash him as a caged bird. Over the five cities, one after the other, Era upon each of the skies dropped a terror weapon. The five cities of the valley he finished off, and they were overturned to desolation. With fire and brimstones, they were upheavaled. All that lived there was turned to a vapor. By the awesome weapons were mountains toppled. Where the sea waters were barred, the bolt broke open. Down into the valley, the sea's waters poured. By the waters that flooded, the, the valley was flooded. When upon the cities... Ashes, the waters poured, steam was rising from them to the heavens. It is done, Era and his skyship shouted. In Nurgle's heart, there was no more vengeance. Surveying their evil handiwork, the two heroes were puzzled by what they saw. By a darkening of the skies that were followed by brilliances, a storm began to blow. Swirling within a dark cloud, gloom from the skies as an evil wind carried. As the day wore on, the sun was obliterated with darkness on the horizon. At nighttime, a dreaded brilliance skirted its edges. The moon and its rising, it may disappear. When dawn the next morning came from the west, from the upper sea, a storm wind began blowing. The dark brown cloud directed it eastward. Toward the settled lands did the cloud spread. Wherever it reached death to all that lives, it delivered mercilessly. Sounds like the Black Plague. From the Valley of No Pity, spawned by the brilliances towards Shamir, the death was carried. To Enlil and Enki, Ninurta and Nurgle, the alarm sounded. Unstoppable, the evil wind del delivers death to all. Enki and Enlil transmitted the alarm to the gods of Shamir. Escape, escape to all of them, they cried out. Let the people disperse, let the people hide. From their cities, the gods did flee like frightened birds from their nests, escaping they were. Mm, escaping they were. Mm -hmm. The people of the lands by the evil storm's hand were clutched. Feudal was the running. Stealthily was the death, like a ghost, the fields and the cities it attacked. The highest walls, the thickest walls, the, like floodwaters, it passed. No door could shut it out. No bolt could turn it back. Those who were behind the locked doors hid inside their houses. 
and were felled like flies. Those who in the streets fled were in the streets as the corpses piled up. Cough and phlegm filled the chests, and their mouths were filled with spittle and foam. Yeah, it's causing them to foam at the mouth. It's a black, just straight up black death. As the evil wind, that was the, the, the that was what the uh, ancient aliens was about this past week. And here's an example of that. Uh, oh, our good buddy uh, Sukalos Apocalypse says probably the funniest fucking thing that's ever been said on, on an ancient alien series, and that is penis sheath. Some people say this is a penis sheath. I was like, Jesus Christ, just call it what it is, a fucking cock holster. <laughs> Here is a 5,000-year-old cock holster that I believe is, was found in Eric Von Daniken's asshole. As the evil wind were unseen to the people, engulfed their mouths were drenched with blood. Slowly over the lands, the evil wind blew. From west to east, over plains and mountains, it traveled. Everything that lived behind it was dead and dying. People and cattle, all alike, perished. The waters were poisoned. In the fields, all vegetation withered. From Aridu in the south to Sapar in the north, the evil wind did overwhelm the land. Bibili, where Marduk's supremacy was declared, was spared by the evil wind. So B Babylon, Babili was, interestingly enough, uh, spared by the wind. So that's the end of the 13th tablet. We have here the synopsis of the 14th tablet. And uh, we'll go ahead and read this tonight. I'll probably read it again before we start the 14th tablet tomorrow. Synopsis of the 14th tablet. Babili, Marnock's chosen center, survives the calamity. Inki sees it as an omen of Marnock's inevitable supremacy. Enlil ponders the past, fate, and destiny, accepts Marnock's supremacy, and retreats to faraway lands. The brothers bid a sentimental goodbye. Inki sees the past as a guide for foretelling the future. He decides to commit it all to record for posterity. And uh, colophone by the scribe in Dubsar. So 314, 314 is where we'll pick up next time. And that's interesting. That, that brings us up to what this whole thing was, was supposedly about. And it's interesting when you look, when you read this, and you know, some people say, oh, this is bullshit, and this is just Zachary Stitch and stuff. And it, you know, uh, it very well may be. But the fact of the matter is, is that these texts exist. They are there. They are real. And you can't deny that the things that we're being warned about in this are exactly the things that have taken over our planet. And that's why all this stuff was taken and, and turned into religion and phony fairy tales without any context. Because if we truly know what happened in the past of our ancestors and possibly on other planets happened to them, if, according to, to this genealogical and historical record of Nibiru, then this is a warning that we should all take serious heed to so that we don't go the same way that these people who created us went on their planet, and that just seems to be exactly the way the New World Order wants to take us. Time to pull our heads out of our asses and realize that this, you know, this is what they've been hiding, and I know there's more that we haven't found yet that they probably got in the Vatican Library, but we'll get there. Thanks to everybody for tuning in tonight. Again, folks, we are, we are in desperate need of your support right now. TheGoalReality.com, use the chip in banner of the donate button. Please help us meet our goal um, so we can take this thing to the next level because it's time. We can't wait another year. We've got to do this now. My name is Josh Reeves. I love each and every one of you. We'll see you next time on the broadcast. Have a great one. Take care.